Hi everyone and welcome to Intro Psych. We're starting things off in Unit 1 by looking at the history of psychology. Now before we launch into it, it's important to note that psychology is a very pluralistic and fragmented discipline. For instance, there's lots of ways to look at psychology. In most Canadian universities, you can study psychology as an art or a science. And the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science usually only vary based on their electives. As we'll see over the course of the history of psychology, there's many different ways to view, study, and analyze the same psychological phenomena. So let's get to it. You'll note here we have a timeline, but please note that the dates on the timeline are approximate only, just showing some key milestones. For many of the dates, such as behaviorism, it was beginning around the 1900s and going to the 1940s. So 1920 there is just marking a key time where Watson's work became popular. Uh, so these are just kind of placeholders to help you. You don't need to memorize dates for this course. It's just to sort of help you with understanding the ebb and flow of different schools of psychological thought. Now, before psychology was ever actually called psychology, uh, there were predecessors called the parents of psychology, where some content related to psych was discussed. And those two main parents are the schools of philosophy and the schools of physiology. So first, we're going to talk about how in philosophy, a lot of psychological phenomena was discussed before psychology was really formalized as an academic discipline. So we think about philosophy, there's a couple different schools of philosophy that Western psychology tends uh, to harken back to, uh, primarily Western philosophy. So philosophy as an academic discipline uh, can overlap with psychology when we think about uh, theoretical topics such as what is thinking? How do we know what we know? And what are the good traits? What's an important trait for a person to have versus what's less of a desirable trait? What is the good? What is virtue? Now, where most Western psychologists start this discussion is with the Western philosophers from ancient Greece. In particular, we like to talk about Plato and Aristotle. Uh, now, the important thing to remember is the name psychology actually goes back to ancient Greek. Uh, and that's because the Greek letter psi actually comes from the Greek word psyche to mean the mind. And then logos refers to the study of. So psychology is the study of the mind. Now, in terms of Aristotle and Plato, uh, they debated on lots of different psychological topics, such as what is the nature of the mind? Are infants born with innate knowledge? Are babies entering this world having some assumptions and ideas about the world? Or do babies come into the world uh, fully ready to be impressed upon and their experiences shape their knowledge? Plato and Aristotle also disagreed on what is the purpose and nature of learning. Should we promote education for the individual and to promote it for the individual learning so a person can learn, so they can grow and they can flourish? Or is the purpose of education to help society flourish? And then, of course, uh, one of my personal favorites is Aristotle's work on the virtues. And so this is the idea uh, that virtues are moderations of characteristics. That is, if we think about something like someone who is overly reckless and dangerous and someone who is too cautious that they're not enjoying one's life, these extremes could be considered vices versus the middle of that spectrum would be considered the virtue. And that would be someone who is moderately careful in their day to day life. Another example could be someone who's overly frivolous with their money and careless versus someone who's overly frugal and stingy with their money. Those would be the vices on the extremes versus moderate generosity would be in the middle and that would be considered the virtue. And so this reflects modern day personality psychology, uh, talking about how if somebody's too much of an extreme extrovert or too much of an extreme introvert, it's going to be hard for them to flourish in lots of different contexts versus someone who is more a mix of an introvert extrovert, they're going to be more be able to handle uh, life's challenges in different places. So after the Greek philosophers, another type of philosophy we tend to mention is that of the Renaissance and post-Renaissance scientific enlightenment philosophers from Western Europe. In particular, we like to mention Francis Bacon, who is known for really putting forward the idea of empiricism. So this is the idea that we can't just know some, something from thinking about it. We actually have to test it. We have to experience it. That's what empiricism is. And this really laid the groundwork for the scientific method. 
opposite to that, we actually have Rene Descartes, who you may know as being famous for his quote, I think, therefore I am. This quote Quote, this quote represents uh, the idea of dualism. So this comes from a primarily Christian uh, viewpoint, and it's the idea that the body and the mind were separate. So it's the idea that after a body dies, the spirit or the soul or the mind continues, that there's a difference between the material realm and the spiritual realm. So this type of thinking, dualism, has since been rejected from modern day psychology, uh, but it did influence psychology's history for quite a long time. Then, of course, we have the philosopher John Locke, who put forth an idea called tabula rasa. This harkens back to the Greek philosophers in mentioning that we are born as blank slates. That's what tabula rasa refers to, and that our personality, our experiences, our attitudes are shaped by our experiences and our life. Now, aside from Western philosophy, modern day psychology has also started to incorporate Eastern philosophy. And one example is that of Buddhist psychology. There's many different things that we have taken and adopted from secular Buddhism. Most importantly, mindfulness. This is the idea that being present in your everyday moment and not thinking about abstract distractions in the future or the past can help us with our mental health. I like uh, this uh, sculpture taken from New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, which shows a person playing on their cell phone and leaning on their vehicle and not enjoying the nature of the parkland and the river behind them. And so this is the idea that the person is not being mindful or present in their given moment. Another idea that incorporates secular Buddhism with psychology is that of emotional attachments to people, to places, to things, to opportunities, to achievements in our life. And this is the idea that our attachments to things in our life can really influence our emotions, can influence our decisions and our motivations. And finally, another area of Buddhism that overlaps with modern day psychology is the idea of unmasking our emotions. It's the idea that sometimes when someone's very angry, this anger is actually a mask that's protecting them from their underlying feelings of fear. And sometimes when someone's fearful, that's also a mask protecting them from the underlying feelings of sadness. Sadness is actually one of our most potent and powerful emotions, and it can be very devastating to feel grief. And so to protect us from that, we often stay in the realms of fear or anger uh, as, as this armor. And so understanding that sometimes when you're very hostile and angry towards something, it's because you fear it's going to go wrong. And if it does go wrong, it's going to lead to massive amounts of sadness. Now, another area of philosophy that has been with Western psychology from the start, but has only recently been uh, celebrated the way it should have been, is indigenous psychology. And so we're getting more uh, aware of this with the uh, decolonization of education and with the indigenization of post-secondary school. And so it's important to understand that many North American psychologists have worked with indigenous communities from the outset of the history of psychology. And this has informed a lot of our methodological techniques, since there's our qualitative research technique. It's informed how we understand consciousness and dreams, spirits quests, and how our consciousness can be shaped through the use of psychoactive substances, such as peyote or ayahuasca. It's also influenced how we understand how people learn best, that we don't always learn best by books and memorization, but through hands-on learning, through being taught with someone you respect and trust, uh, and through uh, being outdoors and being uh, able to explore. There's also incorporated theories about resilience and what it takes uh, to face adversity and overcome adversity. And finally, intergroup theories about what happens when people are marginalized or when they are othered. So this is a very important part of philosophy that we're just starting to learn how to reincorporate into the main narrative of psychology. Now, aside from our philosophical roots, it's important to also talk about the physiological roots. When we talk about the physiological roots, it's very common for us to just think about the brain. And although the brain is really the showstopper and the spotlight, there's a lot more going on in our bodies that can be spoken about in psychology than just the brain. For instance, before psychology was formalized as a discipline, there were people studying biology and physiology that helped to shape the psychological narrative. We can start with talking about Charles Darwin. So Darwin is known for his work on natural selection and evolution and his ideas of adaptive behavior and how these adaptive behaviors ran in families really helped to influence us. 
So Charles Darwin may be known best as his work with the finches on Galapagos Island and understanding that different finches had different style beaks uh, to specialize in getting different types of food that were available to them. Humans do this as well. Our traits, our attitudes can become adaptive based on the different contexts within we are living. Now Darwin had a cousin by the name Francis Galton and he looked at some of Darwin's work and adapted it more so to humans, looking at how these human traits could be unique. Things like our fingerprints, things like reaction time or intelligence tended to vary between different individuals. Galton also noted that some of these traits ran in families. The intelligence may run in families and reaction time may run in families. And this started to understand the heritability of certain traits. Please note that Francis Galton is known to be a bit of a problematic figure due to his uh, connection with the eugenics movement. However, he still did lay the groundwork for understanding these individual differences in psychology. Next up, we have the Germans. In particular, there's Hermann Hemholtz, and he stands out from the crowd because unlike a lot of his contemporaries, he was um, very much an atheist to the point he made a lot of his grad students take an atheist oath. And this is the idea that they swore they wouldn't be persuaded by the idea of, of spirituality, that they were the, uh, looking at the scientific mechanisms that described a lot of our physiological uh, components. So what he was interested in looking at was the idea that we could find a cause and effect, a mechanical chain reaction to everything we thought was free choice, to love, to personality, to your choice in your lunch menu. He believed we could identify the chemicals or the hormones or the chain reactions in our body that would determine all of this. And he very much believed in biological determination and not free will person who worked with Hermann Hemholtz was Gustav Fechner. And unlike Hemholtz, Fechner was a spiritual man. He believed in this divine reality in which trees and butterflies and lakes had spirits. And he believed in love and free choice. And he believed in harmony. But through his work with Hemholtz, he became disenchanted. And he started to realize that you could discover a chain reaction to things. There were mechanical uh, ex explanations for many things that he thought were spiritual. So Fechner wrote about this in two mutually exclusive worlds. He believed the day world was this spiritual, beautiful place with harmony, and the night world was this cold, mechanical place devoid of love and true emotion and freedom. And this conflict was very stressful to him. Some uh, historical records claim that Gustav actually went blind temporarily because of the stress of this conflict, though other cases claim that it's because of his work with candles and lights in the dark that it caused uh, a blindness strain because of the lights. 